can I now uh, invite uh, your link? Maybe we could give a little bit uh, a broad overview about the UN Anthropocene processes. Uh, uh, but just to let everybody know that the original text of the UN Anthropocene actually is not, it does not have anything on the agenda. Uh, yeah, the convention is, um, is um, different. So let's, let's just understand the whole scenario before we actually talk about whether or not gender friendly or gender friendly can be. Thank you very much, Sunita. Um, and good morning again, um, friends. Um, I just just a, a sort of quick, uh, you know, many of you I think have been following the climate change issues in different ways. Uh, as we know, uh, the well back in 1990, 1991, when when the UN Convention, Framework Convention on Climate Change was being negotiated, it was very much driven by the science. Uh, I think the, the acknowledgement uh, from the work of the uh, Governmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, after a lot of debate, and the debate wasn't just scientific, as many of you are aware, it was also very political. Whether, you know, uh, is it just El Nino, we always say, we always say everything to El Nino, uh, or, uh, you know, so the question of, yes, the, 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 the science is telling us that there are more and more extreme uh, weather events, we see shifts uh, in temperature, but is it human uh, activity related? So that was a big debate of the IPCC. Uh, and I, uh, I don't know whether I can say I have the privilege or the misfortune of being in the last IPCC assessment, and I think a number of people from the university were also involved. I was in the working group on mitigation, and it was anything but science. It was extremely political, especially given the fact that the last fifth assessment of the uh, IPCC was also the uh, basis for a lot of uh, what was going to go into the Paris Agreement. So and I want to make this, this point because. I think sometimes there is, uh, at least for the public, there is a, a, a misconception that climate change is only somehow about environment or very scientific and that we can understand it. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the, the greenhouse gas uh, that keeps getting more and more collected in the atmosphere is very directly related to human activity and the use of fossil fuels. Uh, at the same time, it really is also the, the almost like the, the most negative sort of emission of the rubbish when we have development models go wrong. So it is actually about what kind of growth, what kind of development model, what kind of, what kind of development vision we have, because that determines what kind of energy, agriculture policy, transport, urbanization, and all these to how much emissions we have from greenhouse gases. So it is really about development. Um, and it is also about human rights. Uh, I think when we saw this uh, clip, the video when we started this morning, because in the end people are affected. When the environment goes wrong, people are directly affected. So it is very much a human rights issue. Uh, and, and, and definitely in terms of for every negative impact of social, economic, environmental consequences, the disproportionate burden on women uh, and the more vulnerable groups of society is very increased. And women not just as victims, I think there's also this portrayal of women always as victims. I think in the, rest, in the impact of climate change, we see women really at the forefront of also having to adapt, having to, from whether, whether from seed selection, so that we know what seeds will grow under what conditions, to having to grab the children when the early morning systems don't work in the country, uh, and when the typhoons hit you, you know. Um, so we see a lot of that, but it's very silent, it's not recognized. So then when we get into the policy making at the national level, or we go and negotiate at the international level of who should do what, the contributions of, of people uh, and of women uh, in particular uh, are not recognized. You know? And sometimes not recognized because, not because it is rejected, but because it's not even consciously appreciated. And I think that uh, is, is something that has been what uh, a lot of women's groups, including many people around the table, have been trying to do in the last few years, which is, uh, and, and you participated very actively at the UN negotiations in the past years uh, with the Women and Gender Caucus, uh, which I think is one of the most uh, vocal, organized civil society groups, not just in the climate convention, but also across all the UN processes. And I think that, that has been very important. And I think what, what is the very significant part is that the women and gender groups have been using the human rights argument, as with many other civil society groups. It's about right to development, uh, it's about right to um, sexual reproductive health, it's very directly linked to resilience and vulnerability on, on climate impacts. But also, there is not a question of seeing the word women appear 
in how many paragraphs. It's really how the whole policy or whole uh, uh, treaty really understands uh, the, the structural uh, role of all gender. And I think that's, we, are, we haven't got there yet, but I think that uh, the consciousness is growing. So that's as a background. Now, in terms of uh, the, the sort of recent Paris uh, agreement that everybody talks about, the fight was really, I mean, we, we do have a legally binding treaty already. We have had it since 1992. And even though it was mostly science and the fear of many developed countries that if the world will warm up and there's going to be a climate crisis, then the developing countries cannot deal with climate change, then you have climate refugees. And so it was a lot of also that fear. But also there was in the 90s, early 90s, there was a recognition. It wasn't just about climate change. It was also the same period where the loss of forests across the world became a very global issue. And that's why we also have all the debate around indigenous peoples, local communities' knowledge, the need to conserve and use forests sustainably. So the, the so-called three real conventions from the Rio de Janeiro summit uh, on, on, on environment and, and development in 1992 are very significant. One on climate change, one on biodiversity, and one on uh, land degradation and desertification. So it is a package. But unfortunately, in the last 25 years, this package of looking at forest land management uh, and climate has somehow been recently were quite holistic. Whatever the criticisms may have of the outcome of the 1992, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, UN summit and all the treaties and Agenda 21, I think people don't even remember the Agenda 21 when we talk about it. Today we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals you know, as a new thing. But really, we're not talking about anything new, right? Those of us who are working on this, and some people around the table are saying, we were working on this for decades, from the 70s, we were talking about these issues, Stockholm Conference on Environment. So it's not new, we're not talking about anything that needs to be so new. But what we do have is a lot of knowledge now. More knowledge, more linkages and interactions about actions and consequences, and even what to do about, about things. A lot of it is very dependent on technology. I think sometimes it's over also emphasis on, on technology. Technology is very important in terms of what kind of energy, what kind of industrial uh, technologies. Uh, it is a very key part. But technology itself is not enough, because a lot of it is about social organizing and society and the role of people. So that holistic approach, I think, is, is very fundamental. And even the 1992 convention recognized that because the framework of action was not just about environment, it was about sustainable development and poverty eradication. And it talked about how, in its objective, we have to also stabilize the greenhouse gas emissions and temperature increase because of food production. That somehow gets forgotten uh, along the way because if we cannot produce food sustainably to feed the population of the world, I mean, it's so fundamental. Uh, and in food production, really, today, 25 years later, the role of women central <coughs> in food production is recognized across the UN. You look at accurate reports, you look at so many uh, studies that come up looking at what's happening on the ground, who is feeding the world. Small farmers uh, and the role of women is more and more recognized at the international policy level. How does that become national policy? Uh, I think is the next challenge. Uh, so very quickly, I think the what we saw actually looking looking at the 1992 climate convention, it actually has very important principles, and those were the principles that became a very big fight in the last ten years. One, it is recognizing that from the scientific point of view, global warming is caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases, and the accumulation of greenhouse gases that creates the temperature rise is absolutely crucial from a scientific point of view because it leads to the concept of historical responsibility and, and equity. So those uh, uh, countries that were the first sort of batch that went into the Industrial Revolution, which is what we call the OECD countries today, or the industrialized or developed countries, it is that historical responsibility that was recognized by those same countries and their societies and their politicians that led us to having the, the UNFCCC, the, the Climate Change Convention, that recognizes historical responsibility and therefore we all have common responsibility to really shift very fundamentally our development pathways, but to do it in a way that is equitable. So the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities really is very, very fundamental. Because it's like saying, even at the national level, we don't expect that the poor and the vulnerable and the weak have to do the same amount of responsibility as those who are rich and powerful and the capacity to do so. So this is fundamental and, and a lot of the fight was over really in the last 10 years. The world has changed. But if you look at something like the Philippines, you know, in, in the UN sort of setting, the Philippines is a middle income country. 
it does not qualify for most of the aid anymore. Uh, and therefore, but we look at the Philippines, it's really, really poor. Even India or China, I mean, these are emerging economies, you know. Yes, in terms of uh, China, I mean, I, I live in Beijing, I've been living here for the last 10 years and working there. It is, in absolute numbers and terms, the largest economy. But because it's big, just because it's huge. I mean, 1.4 billion people is no joke, right? But you go into the country, and then you find that with 1.4 billion people, you still have something like 250 million who are living below poverty line, compared to maybe 600 million 15, 20 years, 30 years ago. So they've come a long way, but they are far from finished in their development uh, challenges. Yeah? But from the outside, we see China as a giant and all that kind of stuff, and therefore, the debate around the Paris Agreement and the road to the Paris Agreement were rich countries, politicians, not the rich societies. You know, but because in the rich countries, you also have poor people. And the, the inequalities in growing. Saying that China should do more than the United States of Europe. That was what they were actually saying in terms of the politics. You know? Which is actually ridiculous when you think about it. right? So, so we had a lot of this debate. And I think one of the most important uh, fights was really rewriting the convention. Saying that the world has changed. So historical responsibility, all that's history. You know, we cannot keep happening about history. Because from about five years ago, the emissions of developing countries, including Malaysia, not just China, all the so-called 30 um, leading sort of middle income, lower and upper middle income countries, these developing countries have been increasing their emissions, right? Yes, because we have been developing, but we haven't been developing sustainably. Because the 1992 agreement was that developed countries would cut their emissions because they have developed, become rich and able to do so. So you cut emissions across your economy. But developing countries have a lot of poverty to deal with sustainable development. But how to do it? Not in the same pattern. So we were talking about renewable energy and better planning and sustainability, but we didn't do it. So the failure of implementation was a failure of everybody. Of course, at the national level, I think we all did something. Not that nothing was done but not enough to bring the, the temperature rise under control. Okay. So the developed countries failed in their promise that they should cut more in their own countries, that they should provide the finance not because it's charity, but because of their historical responsibility they must now give to the international community, especially the developing countries and the poor countries, the, the financial resources and the technology support and to build capacity so that you can set up monitoring surveillance systems, early warning systems, meteorological departments that actually are able to look at uh, weather patterns, uh, or even organizing in an extreme typhoon, you know, just to have the logistical capacity to evacuate and move your people from one place to the other place. All that needs a lot of capacity, uh, not just equipment, but human capacity. So this was recognized that that was the deal. Right? So we have concepts and obligations like new and additional finances to be given for climate actions, not development aid and not charity, but above the development aid, we have to give new and additional. This was all agreed legally binding in an international treaty. But there was failure of implementation. And for many developing countries, those who can do, will do, have been doing something. And sometimes you have no choice. I mean, if you live in Beijing or Delhi, then if there is pollution, it's not just about global warming can't breathe because you are being poisoned by the, by the pollution. So you have to do something about it. Uh, when we have forest fires in, 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 in Southeast Asia, it's not just about emissions, it's also about you know, health and, and pollution. So in many ways, things have been done, but not enough. And meanwhile, our development path has not gone in a sustainable manner. So because of all that, we then reached uh, 2005, 2007, 2009, and we find that the temperature is rising. Now, even now, so, so a lot of the fight was, okay, we all recognize that there is a climate crisis. We have to do more because we didn't do enough. But who should do more and who should do what? That has been the big fight for the last 10 years. So the, the sort of more powerful uh, countries, richer countries, over the last 10, 15 years, we've also seen another pattern, which is that instead of getting more democratic and having society have a bigger say to, to talk about policies in developed countries, in Europe, in North America, in Australia, in Japan, they have become, the politicians become more and more and parliamentarians, more and more sort of answerable to big business rather than to future generations or to the current society or to those who are suffering from climate impacts or whatever the problems are. And this pattern has been very disturbing so that when you go to a negotiation in the United Nations, any negotiation about this climate change, you listen to the positions of these countries. They're not actually positions of the country. They're positions on vested interest groups. 
So when the United States negotiators come and say, we cannot take back to Washington, and this is what they told us in Paris, we cannot take back to Washington anything that is legally binding on mitigation, on emission cuts. We cannot have anything legally binding with numbers on financial responsibility. Because it will never get approved by a Congress. Uh, and then you have the Europeans saying, we have a lot of refugees from Syria and Afghanistan now flooding into our borders, and, uh, and China is richer than us. So what we will say informally. informally. So China should be paying, because they have a lot more money than Europe. Europe is poorer than China. Okay? But actually, the Chinese numbers look big, but the Chinese economy is very much. The rest of Europe is more stable. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of resources, a lot of money. It's just not in the hands of the governments for public use at home and internationally. It's, you know, we don't tax anymore. We allow tax havens. Big companies are very, very rich. What was the latest uh, study from Oxfam in uh, Great Britain? The 62 richest billionaires in the world own more than half the world's population. Now, of course, you can say a lot of the population are very poor and all that. But half the world includes you and me. I don't see that it's too billion so 62, I mean, the inequality is unsustainable. It is unethical, and I, I think it is almost criminal. Because these people got very rich because they influence what kind of laws internationally and nationally could be made, so that they will protect them. And these are the kind of interests that shape uh, international negotiations. Um, so I think what was very important in Paris was, and Malaysia played a very important role. Because Malaysia, because you cannot negotiate on your own, you know, when, when you are fighting against China. Uh, because the other side is also very important. They were the, the number of the most richest countries because of the best interest influence their policy. We're talking here about the United States, we're talking about Japan, Canada, Australia, even Norway. Norway is very good on many things, but because of their oil, the Indian climate negotiations did they were very, very tough right? So these countries were determined to change the rules, to shift their legal obligations in the name of the world has changed, to shift it to the bigger development. And because they could not name China in a treaty, and they must do so much more, they had to say, okay, least developed countries, you can be up. Small island states, you're very vulnerable, because small island states are really very, very, you know, you're going to drown and disappear. By the way, Singapore is part of small island states, right? And Singapore has the highest per capita. So, but they are, because they're small island, so they, they can be tough down. Okay. And then the rest of it will be more or less do. So we, we do not want to differentiate between developing and developing and the four stages of development anymore. So the 30 countries called the right minded development country grouping, of which Malaysia uh, was not just an active member but was a leader, uh, did very, very good work. It was not easy to defend the basic principles of the convention. Because the Paris Agreement was something that we were supposed to do over a four year period. The decision to have a new agreement was in 2011, but not a completely new agreement. It was a big fight. The new agreement is to improve and enhance implementation of climate actions under the convention principles. So it's, it is a child of the mother convention of 1992. The principles of equity, historical responsibility, and all those legal commitments which were not implemented properly or enough, we now must have a separate agreement to enhance implementation. And implementation in a holistic way, not just about cutting emissions, but also adaptation, because they already have impacts of climate change. It is happening, getting worse and worse. How do we deal with adaptation? Because the, most of the developed countries argue adaptation is a national problem. We deal with it at home. Developing countries and civil society argue the reason we have to adapt is because climate change is getting worse. The climate change is getting worse because of the responsibility of the industrialized countries and yes, also of our own responsibility. But that is a disenchanted in a way to change. So fighting for adaptation to be included was very, very important. And now in the last few years, we recognize also that some many many of the impacts you cannot mitigate anymore, you cannot adapt anymore because it's permanent loss. We may we lose chunks of our coastal uh, areas because of salination or just sheer uh, you know uh, level of sea rising. It's gone forever. When your glacier melts and there's no and and, and if no more, you know, glacial uh, system is gone forever. So fighting for the concept that loss and damage is a separate pillar of action and responsibility took us many, many years. And we succeeded to do that. So it is different for adaptation, different for mitigation. So, and then of course, the means of implementation. The financial resources needed. We have to also allocate at home our budget that goes towards the development. 
And whether you like it or not, when we have a huge flood in Kelantan or Kedah, we have to spend the money. You can't make a family come. So countries are already, no matter how poor you are, small island, very rich, already poor. Whenever you have a disaster, you already have to spend money. And disasters also means we lose our GDP for, for, for that. So I think it's been wiped out within one week of intense rain. You can wipe out things we building for 20 years. So, so how to actually have the right technology, the right capacity, the means of implementation of money domestically and also internationally. So this, this were all the facts we have. So what we came out of Paris, because the developing countries managed to on all the key issues come together, and the right number of developing countries, which are mostly the middle income countries so-called, about 30 of the countries, which represent something like more than 50% of the world's population, managed to hold the principles very, very successfully. So we now have common beneficial responsibility, mentioned more times, than in the original convention, because we need to operationalize it, implement it. So we have a whole bunch of things, good and bad. My colleague who uh, leads the kind of uh, work in the world that has done um, an article, we have a copy of Ken Sinita. Uh, so I think here it gives you uh, an overview of some of the key provisions and rights and obligations. Um, so I, this will actually I hope, uh, be useful for you. I just want to quickly then touch on what we do now. Yeah. Um, for Malaysia, I mean, this is not over the agreement now. Uh, we have some agreement. We also have, we have set up a new committee called the, it's called APA, the Ad Hoc Committee Group on the Paris Agreement. So it's called APA. The APA will be, uh, so this will be the, because this, this agreement will only enter into force and expected after 2020. We're not talking about how we've got agreement in the action. No, it will only come into force after 2020. We need about 55 countries to sign or uh, uh, countries that total 55% of the world's uh, ambition, ambition, yeah, of world ambitions, whichever comes first, yeah, then, then it will enter the force. So we expect it to come to force after 2020. So what happens between now and 2020? There was a second decision that actually, actually talked about how we need to do more until this agreement comes into force. And really, developing countries agree to have a new agreement. And under this agreement, countries like Malaysia, developing countries, and agreed to take on more legally binding obligations than in the original convention. <coughs> because we assume, we, we say, okay, we are willing to also do, because under the original convention, developing countries don't have a legal obligation to do emissions cuts. We can be more efficient in the use of energy and do the cut. Cutting means you have to, we are not economists here, cutting means that it, because your, how much you emit is actually a reflection of your GDP. So to cut emissions, you, unless you have 100% renewable energy to replace you know, fossil fuel, you actually have to slow down the growth. So in many cases, you look at the, 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 the projections, you have to slow down the growth. But for developing countries which are poor, right, Malaysia may not fall into that category as such because we have to quite uh, advanced in our development, but we still have a lot of development that is for. So for us, for developing countries, the, the, the it was more, uh, you, it's voluntary, but you need to do it so we have more energy efficiency, and then you also have to shift towards renewable energy and things like that, right? So, but now under the convention, we undertake as developing countries to also take mitigation actions, right? To be determined according to your level of development and ability, but we're taking on more obligations. Developed countries under the original treaty has a legally binding, they must do emissions cuts across the entire Every sector. That was the agreement. In the Paris Agreement, it says developed countries should take the lead. From the legal point of view, they have stepped back. This is because of the United States. They say we cannot take the word shell back to the United States. Because if it says shell is legally binding, they must go to Congress. And Congress will never agree to any kind of So the US trick is to say if you put should and you know things like that, then we don't need to go to Congress. The president can sign. But after the election next year, if a new president comes, the United States' commitment to this agreement is worth nothing. But for the rest of us, we will be in there. So we expect that there will be more and more pressure. They won't, won't stop in the APA and whatever, or in the financial aid. They will put more pressure on the bigger developing countries to do more. Okay. And Malaysia, we are not a big country, but because we are quite developed, uh, we will also be pushed to take more, and we can expect that. Now, at home, I don't care what happens uh, at the international level, we want our government to do more. We 
want our society to do more. We want to shift to more sustainable development. So at home, we as civil society groups will keep pushing the government to say, you're not doing enough. At the international level, we want fairness and equity because the other side is doing even less. One of the most important contributions that got civil society groups across the world for the Paris uh, negotiation was uh, these other big networks like uh, from even WWF and you know, some of the big Oxfam, uh, many developing country uh, NGOs networks, including the own network and many colleagues. Uh, we put together a team of scientists, economists, civil society activists, and we did a civil society activity review. We took all the more than 160 uh, national action plans that all governments put on the table to say this is what we will do after 2020 under the same And we just look at mitigation. Right? Because developed countries only wanted to talk about mitigation in Paris. But developing countries managed to get everything in. Adaptation, loss and damage, no finance, all those things. So we have more of a holistic But when you look at the actual action plans, we calculated that if we only do this, the whole world, temperature increase will be about 4 degrees. Whereas we're supposed to try to go below 2, or even try hard to go for 1.5. We are, if we go on this current thing, it's 4 degrees. It's a catastrophe. Okay? But just looking at those uh, plans, and looking only at emissions reduction or mitigation, we found that a country like China, and then we calculate how much uh, the rich countries have used up since, uh, you know, the syndicated industrial revolution to now, we look at capacity to per capita GDP of countries to take actions. So we have a formula and a sort of a model. And we found in that study that the US is doing 20% less than what we should do as a fair share. The EU is doing about 20%. No, the EU is also doing below 20%. Russia is doing zero. This is what Russia says it will do or will not do. Amount to zero percent of what it should do. Because the Russians want to win. China is doing a, a little bit more than its fair share. And actually the most ambitious plan on the table now in the UN on climate action up to 2030, 2050 is actually China. They have pledged, and I don't know how they're going to do it, they will peak in 2030. In other words, from 2030 onwards, they will start going down across all the economy conditions. That's pretty ambitious. And nobody's going to give them money to pay for it themselves. And we get technology for that. So at the same time, we find that when you want to get technology for solar and the best you know, renewable and other technologies, most of the good technologies that exist are in the hands of big companies in the developed world. And they only want to make money. So one of the big fights we have in the, in the convention, in, in, in trying to implement our convention and in the treaty, is that there must be technology to transfer. We must have more public information. And how do we get you know, more public models of developed technology that will not be locked up in a pattern for 20 years of strong intellectual you know, monopoly or quality? So that's a big debate. But the developed countries say, because most of the technology is in the private sector, we cannot interfere. So we go to the marketplace and Look, if you want to save the world from climate change, we need to have the best technology developed and to get it out there and spread it as fast as possible, as cheaply as possible. Right? So this is a big fight. And so India and some other developing countries say we must include something in the new movement that says we must overcome the barriers to technology transfer. And one of the barriers is intellectual property rights which are not balanced, in other words, not balanced towards climate change in the public is balanced more towards private profit. So we need to have a better balance that was totally rejected by the developed countries. For the United States, we cannot even mention the word intellectual property rights. Not allowed. You don't see. It's not allowed. Not allowed. At all. It's, it's a word that cannot be put there as a negative thing. Even the word barriers to technology transfer, they will not allow that. So you don't find that word that. You were there until the last week uh, of the Paris so fighting for equity, fighting for, you know, all this. So, so now we have something that is not totally bad. We've saved the mother convention, but we need to implement, we need to really continue to sort of uh, fight for those principles and then do as much as possible at home also. In this battleground, it is not surprising that the whole dimension of gender sort of didn't come into its own because it got caught in the battle. Some of the strongest supporters of uh, stronger gender language were well, countries like Norway and Europe. Okay, maybe I'm cynical, alright? 
but I, I suspect sometimes they were pushing that very strongly also. And they were taking very bad position at the moment. So they were trained, everybody was training every issue off. So, so for many of us, you know, that it, most of the time it sounded like the developing countries, especially like Saudi Arabia and all these countries, like they're so anti-gender or anti-human rights, right? Whereas the Japanese were Norway and the EU. But then you go to the other room where they're talking about the obligation and financial uh, obligation, then they are wow. You know? and, and that's one of the reasons why, even before Paris, the last meeting in Bonn, they were speaking for a number of years, observers were not allowed to leave the room. They were all picked up. Because Japan and the US and all these countries said, if there are observers in the room, we want to negotiate. Because if we're in the room, we know what the positions are. They come from the country. You know, they come to the table, they so they didn't want that. So we were all picked up in the room. And these are the countries that talk about transparency. <laughs> okay. Now, transparency is the other big part of the agreement, more than in the convention. So there's a lot of reports that have been done. And again, the rich countries say, we must all be treated the same. Whether you are Malaysia or United States, you have the same rules of accounting and reporting. Now, we can't even get many statistics. Even Malaysia, don't talk about some of the poorer countries. Whenever we do any study, right, you know how hard it is to get statistics. Or you have five sets of statistics that all need to make. So what is the real number? Even Malaysia, we have a lot of problems with basic data. So but there's a lot of reporting now. Now, there is still differentiation between developed and developing countries. But in practice, you know, it's going to be quite hard. So now we have an uh, obligation every two years, we have to do a biannual update report. Malaysia just submitted the first one, because all countries are supposed to do the first one for 2015. Right? So NRA, you know, is coordinating the ministry. In 2018, which is not so far away, there will be a review of all the national action plans which have been submitted last year. 2018. And the developed countries force us to accept in the decision that came from Paris. The 2018 is not going to be reviewing holistically all the actions, including but we also want to review actions of the developed countries in terms of giving us technology, finance, etc. Right? But this review in 2018 is only about mitigation. So in theory we can also review their mitigation targets, which is very low in the, in the developed world. But they are more organized to question you than we question them. And we have seen some of these reviews that are going on in other issues already, right? We will be looking. Because our capacity is not the same. Okay, the US will study every Malaysian law and directive and circular you have, right? And, what, and every policy and plan, whether you need it or not. Whereas, how are we going to study everything in the US? Even if they don't have anything, we can't go to Australia. Right? Anyway, so, so now we have this very really key. And then every five years, there will be a review of this national action plans, which is more holistic, the project the goal is not clear, right? So a lot of reporting. I don't know when we are going to find the time and energy to do that, because we have to do a lot of reporting. So we also say, but we also want you to report on your, 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 your obligations in the rich world, right? But like I say, let's see how it will go. Um, now, the other thing you know is the EU, because they are 28, this piece of 28, but the state is 28. Mm -hmm. The EU submitted one climate action plan for the entire European Union, not 28. Right? So a lot of our friends who are the CSOs in Europe, they're very frustrated because they want to take national plans and then you know to work at home. And you, you only have this uh, climate plan for the whole Europe. So then within Europe there's some yeah, then no more target. Yeah, they have target in Europe, they gave like 20% reduction or whatever. They already fulfilled it last year. Europe is doing far less than what it can do. So if you look at the European uh, target, they already met it, they already satisfied it last year. So we say, look, you should do more because you can do more. Right? Between now and 2020, uh, I don't think we're going to see this. So this emissions gap, who is going to do that gap to bring us down to 2%? The pressure will be on developing countries. Now, Malaysia's plan uh, is that we will, uh, for the future, I think we need to look at the Malaysian action plan. So we need to look at that to see what we have agreed to do. And I think part of the frustration I sense from NRE is that other parts of the government still think it's an NRE issue. It is not, right? Because whatever we say we'll do means that EPU, uh, transport, uh, in every ministry, they will have to do a lot of things, agriculture, definitely, yeah? Uh, transport, 
money, more public transport, less cars. <laughs> right, right. So we have to do this because we have committed. Malaysia has standards, and I think for forests, we say by 20, I can't remember the year, by something something, we are going to have net emissions from forests. We do a lot of forest cutting and land conversion. How are we going to do that? Does it, but it doesn't mean planting more plantation. Yeah? It's about diversity and so. And all these actions have impact on rights of communities because it's their land, it's their forest, it's their fishing uh, resources. So there's a lot of this to do. So I think at the national level, just to conclude, uh, how do we, uh, I think we need to support NRE uh, at the national level to sort of, uh, and then put some uh, demands on the uh, EPU and you know, to the highest EPU level. Right now we are, we are very, we are things to start with our we need to look at because this is a it's, it's a development model and much shift. It's a power shift. It's a power shift of fossil fuel energy, power, power, and also power of people who respond to the same one. Um, and so we, we really need to do that. It's not just an around issue. And now we have this thing about whether Malaysia will join or not join the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement, the GDP. Right? Okay, Parliament says we approve dining education, but we know what is. It's 6,300 pages and more. Uh, some of us have formed a, a research group from different NGOs. We are looking through this agreement. Many of you are involved in that, trying to study it. There are concerns that many of the things we say we will do in the time of agreement may not be able to be implemented because of the GPPA. Because the GPPA has 30 chapters, only six deal with goods, the other 24 deal with regulations and policies. So whether they will, in fact, we were talking to somebody from Geta, and they are concerned because Geta wants to promote green procurement. Whether green procurement is conditions, uh, will it run into some, some restrictions? So we need to look at this CPA and see whether all the sustainable development policies which will allow us, which will require us to take many policy decisions, whether we can do that or not, and not run into trouble, before we actually ratify. And we ratify the legal. That we're going to be signing on two days time, you know, the signs it. But before, we I mean, two years ago, we decided, you know, whether we want to really, really, really join the GPA. It's a lot of uh, assessment to do. And you cannot only look at the environment chapter to understand whether the impact on the environment is not the environment. Even environment impact, if you look, I think we counted that at least 12 to 14 chapters that will impact the environment. Uh, for finance, 21 out of the 30 chapters will affect our financial, Ministry of Finance policy and existing policy. So, so, so we have different sets of international obligations that we agree to, but many of them may not be consistent, may be quite contradictory, so we need to study all that. So, so that's why we do need, uh, I think, uh, a very multidisciplinary uh, approach. Um, Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Uh Like I said, you know, once your thing starts giving us the whole scenario, it gets very complicated and it is actually very complex. Um, and uh, those were some of the frustrations when we were going on COP. And you're going to rightly point it out. I mean, uh, for many of us who are from the um, uh, environmental movement, uh, from the civil society, we actually worked a lot on Agenda 21 uh, because that was. Uh, a more comprehensive document that we were looking at, looking at governance, looking at uh, people's of, building people's awareness, uh, issues of sustainable development, uh, way back in, in 1990s. And that's where I also started, in fact, before like, 1990, late 1980s, that's where we started. Um, but a lot of these issues are very complex, and, um, and that's why I brought in Adrian here, because um, as complex as it can be, um, I think what Adrian does uh, with PowerShift and um, the youth um, is a, a very neat model in a sense that uh, it increases awareness uh, but also it promotes um, action. Um, so I would like um, Adrian to share this because I think uh, this is something which um, NCWO and also all of us here um, would like to look at and, and see how we can actually um, strengthen each other because as you know the environmental sphere itself is, is not just environment, you've got to do with your economic uh, planning, uh, you know, your political structure, how you do this, this, this is a multifaceted thing. 
Um, and to just have to deal with it, um, it it's, can be quite uh, a headache. Um, especially when all these different um, government departments are not speaking to each other. Um, so I'll, I'll let um, Adrian share how um, they brought the, the group together and also some of the things that they are actually demanding, um, which is quite ambitious, <laughs> I must admit, but um, it's, it's good to know because they also had a, a youth a declaration, right, for, for to take to Paris and that was the very ambitious uh, declaration, I must say. Yeah. So, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita, for uh, This is uh, Yukling and Yukling and teams and from the team from TWN is, is also, we refer a lot. Uh, during the whole process of uh, the uh, COP21 and, and every other sessions, negotiations in the UN level, they produce uh, daily reports and daily commentaries like this, which all of us and go on the website and just click and read and it's very insightful and very uh, uh, below and above the surface of what's being just discussed on the table but then you get all the background stories you know? so this is uh, the documents produced by the team that the Yolings team is very very helpful so I would encourage everyone uh, who want to understand this issue and climate change negotiations on the international level to really understand, to read what, what they have published so far. Um, the report tells us about four degree increase uh, in, in, in the uh, what, what what is on the table as the action further. Today we are the scientists science tells us that we already reached 0.8 degrees increase of temperature since the industrial age. And this 0.8 degrees we are seeing uh, what uh, record year after year record typhoon in Philippines, uh, uh, re record uh, rainfall in Malaysia. Yes, the, all this increase of temperature around the world, creating havoc, uh, weather patterns is no longer there anymore. This is 0.8 degrees. Just imagine 2 degrees. When we're talking about 1.5 to 2 degrees, now we're talking about 4 degrees. So, so imagine all these impacts and all these changes that we're going to adapt uh, in, in years to come. Um, that, that is uh, very alarming for, for us, uh, especially for the uh, younger, younger generations. Uh, the, because science also tells us that by 2050, uh, that's where the major impact, the real impact of the full force of the climate change will, will come to us. Um, it may it affect my future, it may affect some of your children's or your uh, grandchildren's future. So this is what we're trying to say to everyone who's, who's trying to follow this, this, uh, this negotiation, that uh, the impact you may not necessarily see today, which we already see today, but some of us, we are still lucky, uh, we have not really seen a big impact, but the real, real impact is going to come in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, that's, that's what climate change is all about. Um, we're looking back 1970s, you know, uh, I think uh, the, the, that is time where, where all these uh, environment issues and, 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 and the sustainability is coming into action. But that's a time where everybody is saying that, hey, why you go and save the paper, why you go and off the light, you're very camp set, is it? you're very, you're very, uh, very, very stingy, is it? you don't want to share your food, you don't want to... So that's, that's the time where it was starting to develop, you know? that's the time where uh, the, the, it, it already came in, but people had given a different name and different, different <coughs> manner. But now, it's a good thing, now it's being sexy. You know, corporates are taking on to it, you know, many groups are talk, talking to it, uh, hipsters magazines are talking about going green. So this is the wave that we all should be right, right on and, and, and grab on and, and you know, uh, not just talking about it but putting it into action, that's, that's what we want. Um, today we're talking about what we have talked about and, and you can get given through a, a literary history of the whole convention up until this point in time which is, which is uh, touched on many of my points that I want to talk about so I will scrap my whole notes <laughs> and, and I try to bring a different perspective on, on how we can uh, localize what we have done in the UN level and how we can do it locally. What I've learned in, in the past couple of years following and engaging all these COP conferences is that um, it's it's very little lobbying as a civil society, uh, like you and me, at the COP level. Many of the lobbying must be done at the local level. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me try. So, what happens after this 
Paris Agreement came into power ratified. So the, the UN level has to bring back to the uh, federal level, the cabinet has to pass it. The cabinet then probably has different agencies and uh, government, government ministries to, to work on it and then come to state assemblies because um, state governments have a lot of say as well because state, our state, country, our state the government controls land and also uh, uh, a lot of uh, local councils uh, uh, implementation. So, so it has to trickle down from the UN level to the federal level to the state level to the local council level, the DDKL level, and then do not stop there. You have to trickle down to also to your RAs, to your local tenders, to your uh, co condo communities. That is very important as well. But where do you and I come into place? Uh, we, civil society, have to be present at all different levels, you know, from your resident associations up all the way to the ground level. Um, it is very important because um, I, 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 I share some of the uh, things that we, our Malaysian negotiators uh, were negotiating on our behalf in, 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 in on this conference that they have a range of uh, commitments that can they can take up uh, decided by the cabinet. You know, everything which is they have to say and do and, and negotiate on behalf of the, of, of the country was decided probably about two or three weeks before they even uh, leave or probably a month before the really cabinet meeting. The cabinet, uh, the, the ministers have to sign off a, a range of agreement, a range of negotiation range that you can accept before you go. So much of the decisions already made at home, not really at the negotiation level. Uh, we can push, we can, we can, we can help them to uh, help the, the negotiation, the politics of the negotiation table to go to what we like to be, but most of our positions have been decided at home. So it is very much that we have to engage our ministers, our politicians, our elected representatives that, hey, uh, you have to demand for all these other things before even uh, the, the court come into place. So what we do, what we do in Malaysia, uh, in, in for our group, right, uh, uh, young group, uh, youth group, is that we focus on climate change education. Uh, we may not talk so much about the degrees, the temperatures, the how many uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but we very much focus on what we, the local community, can understand and can grasp. It is very what is tangible to us. Uh, for example, we talk about. Of course, the increased intensity of floods. You know, yeah, Malaysia will flood every day. You know, uh, this is a, a, a monsoon region. We, we have floods. You know, it comes in and out here. But now we're seeing the increase of floods, increase of uh, intensity of, of rainfall. That is not normal. That is beyond normal. Um, let's look at uh, this recent couple of two weeks. Now, we blow up the site, we probably got very good tan, sunburn, you know, now the temperature is uh, so crazy. But then, late in the afternoon, you have thunderstorms, like moon, monsoon kind of storms, which is uh, strange for, for this period of time. So, the, the changes of weather patterns, and it has directly impacted us. Uh, of course, now we're talking about only the first three weeks of the, the year in 2016. Numbers are coming up where the dengue infections has soared record breaking as well for the first three weeks of the year. The numbers is, is beyond beyond anybody's understanding. 